I show up home from work that evening and I park my truck in, in, in the driveway. My son come out of the house and he's like, something happened to Natalia at the school. She fell, she hit her head, she, she's crying. I drove over there. When I got there, my daughter is crying, loud, and a lot of pain. She couldn't move her, uh, her legs, neither one. She keeps saying over and over, I can't feel my legs. And I keep asking to her, what happened? She looked at me like she was like lost. She's like, I don't know what happened. I'm like, how did I get here? Like, what's going on? I was like, I don't remember anything. Everything's blank. It was very clear that uh, this girl was on the sidewalk and that a, a car left the roadway uh, and struck her. We had uh, tire track marks, impressions. A motor vehicle had went up and over the curb, straddled the sidewalk, and then eventually came back down on the travel portion of the road. We learned Nicole Poole was 42 years old. She lived in the Des Moines metro area. In the still photo, she was at the front door knocking on the door, but we didn't have any video after that. According to talking to her ex-husband, she was there to see her daughter. The time of, of her being in the area was right. We had to find this Nikki Poole, and we needed to get her in for an interview. We had found out several days later that she was in the Polk County Jail. Nikki Poole had gone to a, a convenience store in West Des Moines. She was clearly either under the influence or having some sort of mental health episode at the time. Natalia thought the vehicle that ran over her, it was a dark colored Jeep, and she thought it was a female driving the vehicle. I authored a search warrant to search that vehicle. It looked like there was a shoe print mark on the passenger side door. And the dirt that was on the car, it looked like impressions from clothing, like that pattern had been impressed into the side of the car. That really started to bring Nicole into the picture as the suspect. I figured Nicole Poole would not answer any of our questions. I figured she'd just sit there and say, no, I want an attorney. So we went in there with a more relaxed approach. So I know you were, you were there getting gas on that. What happened, what did you do before that? Yeah, what were you driving? What color was that? Black. Black? Okay. So what did you do next? I left. Uh-huh. I ran over her. You ran over her on accident? I was just in awe. I kind of had to pause there for a second and try to get my composure. Oh my gosh. She just admitted she ran somebody over. Do you remember what she looked like? We heard she was Mexican when I think she left him. Did you know that she was Mexican when you were approaching her? Yeah, at least on her face I did. Yes. Why why didn't you stop? I, I'm just asking. I just I was just having anxiety that day and just that she was trying to take the arms and just Okay. It's like taking over. What do you mean by taking over at home? Okay. She keeps throwing out Mexican, taking our jobs, taking our home. 
At that point, I, I knew it was way more serious than what I initially that I thought it was. It was a hate crime. When you went over the curb, did, uh, did you accelerate? Did you step on the gas? Yeah. Did you do it because she was Hispanic? Did that happen? Yeah. You did? Okay. Were you hoping that Ginger were actually for that person? Okay. At that time, yes, at that time. Is that right? That yes? Mm -hmm. When we walked out of the jail, we were both kind of in shock. Being a minority, I promise you, it, it hits home. Our investigators heard from the Des Moines Police Department that they were investigating a, a case where uh, a car had gone up onto the sidewalk and a child had been hit by a car. And she was the person that did that. We have a, a single incident, but it just expanded and blossomed into this huge, you know, pattern of activity that she was doing on the whole west side of Des Moines. I really fear that if she had not been stopped at that point, that uh, uh, there may have been other victims in, in other ways. It's really disheartening to see where you can take that rage and turn that toward children who've never done anything to you who are just walking down the sidewalk as all of our community's kids do every day. This behavior is not acceptable anywhere, especially in Clive. It was kind of a relief for us. Oh, you know. Great, they did it, they, find, they found who did it. But then when they give them the notice why she did it. That was a heartbreaking. I was just in a, like, a state of shock. I didn't, I didn't know whether to cry or to scream or to just like run away. I knew there was racism in the world, but I never knew that it would happen to me like two blocks away from my house. My wife and I, we had the idea to leave the country forever, but no one is gonna push me away. We stayed to prove our kids that they belong here. We can't live uh, uh, in fear and we can't let that destroy my family. She was described as having some sort of a mental episode. The mother made a decision to take her up to the hospital to have her checked. The mother and daughter that brought her there left, leaving Rory in the care of the hospital. For whatever reason, she ended up leaving before she was actually seen by a physician. We see her exiting uh, the hospital on her own. That was the last known sighting we had of her. Communications. I'm a plumber and I'm on site for uh, uh, a job. And we got, uh, we're, we're snaking a drain. And we were, uh, we've been pulling back, uh, we probably pulled back about 10 pounds, 15 pounds of like, it looks like flesh type of stuff, meat, and I don't, we don't know what it is. The issue started several days before. He didn't want any plumbers called. Um, he tried snaking the drain himself. Uh, he was taking efforts to, to fix it. Uh, by the 29th, it, it was getting so bad. Uh, the smell, uh, the pipes were backing up into the people's uh, bathtubs. People upstairs just took it upon themselves to call a plumber. 
the officers on the scene decided to knock on the door of Adam Strong's basement apartment. They recall him putting his head down and making a comment almost instantaneously that the, the jig's up, uh, it's a body. He commented to the arresting officer, if, um, if you want the rest of her, she's in my freezer and she's pretty defleshed. And uh, there was, in fact was somebody in the freezer, as Adam said. Rory had a distinct tattoo. She had the word alive tattooed on her neck. And when they looked through the freezer, they found uh, a human head. And there was a tattoo uh, clearly displayed. I knew right then, yeah, it's, it's Rory. We didn't know at that point what the cause of death was. To lay that charge, you, you need the grounds. The decision was made to continue our investigation to see where it took us down the road. Three hours of doing it, it was clear we weren't going to get anywhere. We were just going in circles. Obviously, you don't care enough to help. Are the tissues often needed? Why do you want some? No, no, I'm good. Yeah. Let's just shut it down now. Could have sat there for another three or six hours. I don't think we were going to get any different results. Really, all I got from that interview was a sense of, of who Adam was to help us go into further down the road with the investigation. Thank you very much. It was the worst apartment I've ever been in for clutter and dirt and mess. You could barely move uh, and let, because of a few little walkways in there. There was a number of sex toys located in the apartment, restraining devices, uh, handcuffs uh, and whatnot. There was a bent hammer we had located Rory's DNA on. Rory's running shoes were located in a bag in the apartment. There was blood spatter located on the wall and bottom baseboards leading into Adam's bedroom. That knife's only designed for one use and one use only. It's a knife used for, by hunters for gutting and skinning animals. To a logical person, it doesn't make sense. You keep all that evidence around but seemed to be the way Adam thought. The DNA that was located on that knife, it, was, it, it wasn't through blood. It was tissue-like material. We sent that knife off for analysis. We received the results back. That knife contained the DNA uh, of a second female. 
The second victim uh, was a 19-year-old female who went missing in 2008. And uh, very much like Rory, she um, was out of the house uh, on her own. Both victims were in their late teens, and both victims were uh, of more of a petite build, longer, you know, brown hair. Almost a splitting image of each other. She went missing 10 years prior, and Adam went undetected for 10 years. It makes the hair on the back of your neck stand up. I certainly felt some pressure. The reality is, if there was no conviction, then he was a free man. How you doing? Good, you? Eh, had better days. Oh, I'm sure. Paul Mitten. Adam Strong. Adam, may call me Paul today. Adam. All right, Paul. I have been amazed at how well I have been treated. Other than a few staff members at the 8th SAG. And that's going to continue today. Yeah, yeah. I can tell you that. I mean, that's, I, it's good. That's it's wonderful. Well, you know what? It certainly checked into how he had been treated thus far. That's important. Uh, uh, speaks towards admissibility. Addressed any needs that he had, and he said he hadn't eaten, so we took care of that. I certainly knew we couldn't rush into talking to Adam about the case, given the fact how it went with uh, the two detectives back in December of 2017. Sharing a meal with somebody, breaking bread with somebody, it's a chance to bond and talk. And then once um, that had gone on for an hour and a half or so, I started to talk about the case a little bit. Um, how old was Rory? 18. Okay, how much of her body did you guys get back? Obviously the entire skeletal structure, right? Well, we obviously, whatever was in the house. Yes, in the freezer. Yes. And how much of it were you able to pull out of the pipes? Uh, quite a bit. It was, it was bad luck. Yeah, that's what I tell people. They're like, you're stupid. I'm like, you kidding me? Well. That's an awesome way. Yeah. I just, I just got greedy, that's all. Paul, importantly, doesn't react to what most people would perhaps react to, which is, a, you know, again, a rather shocking thing to say. Every time there was a little bit of information given to me, maybe even unknowingly by Adam Strong, inside I was giving myself a little fist pump, only because I thought we were advancing the case a little bit here. So the 24th is when you start this. You said Christmas Eve? Yes. Are you, are you doing this while it's frozen or is it partially defrosted? Completely defrosted. OK. Now that would take several hours. Uh, no, not a uh, bathtub full of hot water. Oh, okay. Okay. It, like, within a couple hours? I, I wouldn't wager. I had to fill the bathtub up a few times. On that to keep the water hot. Yes. Right. Gotcha. Gotcha. I don't know if I should really be talking about that, but ultimately you do have me on the... Yeah. There's no getting around that. Yep. Yep. He thinks, and they are, only talking about dismemberment and disposal, but in fact it's allowing the, in this case, the judge ultimately to make inferences about what must have happened during the actual murders that took place. Okay. Okay. All right, well, I'm going to blast. Man, go get some sleep, dude. Listen, I appreciate you sticking it out. Well, I'm sure. You really have a choice. No, but... Uh, I probably said more than I should have. Probably. Yeah, probably. The judge watched the entire 12-hour interview, went through it, and the ruling came back quite clearly that uh, Strong was well taken care of, he seemed comfortable, his needs were all met, there was no trickery, there was no oppression. This was essentially a slam dunk in terms of miscibility, which is rare for a 12-hour interview. Adam was convicted of first-degree murder on Rory and ultimately convicted of manslaughter uh, on the second victim. Detective Mitten uh, and the investigative team got a first-degree murder charge and a manslaughter with no confession. There definitely was a danger. They pulled the indignity, so it, 
if things went south in that interview room, I, I, he, may, he may have walked. That would have been a travesty. It's really tough to describe Adam Strong. I have never met an individual like him. It was a, it was a tough investigation, but we, we speak for the victims. We're trying to bring them justice and, and, and give the family answers. The sentence he was given is the maximum sentence you can receive in this country. So yes, I feel justice was served. Control the number one, where's your emergency? I need an emergency right now. The shooting at the, uh, at the corner store next to Stevie. Okay, do you, okay. Do you know if anyone's been hit? Good, okay, good. Get an ambulance here now. We are. Who was hit? Some young man. So he's bleeding to death. Somebody just shot this kid three times. Okay, we got everyone in route to him right now. Look, this guy is dying. I'm okay. Not the guy is dying. The victim was eventually identified by his identification being found in his wallet as Joseph Edward Ross. He was eventually transported to the hospital where he passed. Our crime scene comes, takes photographs, really documents what's going on. Because there is a lot of activity, crowds start developing. So we start going up to those crowds. Hey, did you see what happened? Did you hear what happened? The witness at the scene uh, observed the victim walking through the parking lot, talking on a phone, and arguing. And shortly thereafter, they observed a red Dodge pickup truck pull into the parking lot. Do you have any idea why we might be here? OK, your brother Joe was shot and killed around the corner, over at the corner store. He was shot? Yes. We're trying to find out what happened to him. Do you know anybody that drives like a red Dodge pickup truck? Oh, my friend Nick does. Who's Nick? It's just someone that I met through a friend. What does he look like? Is he white or black? He's white. OK. And he always hangs out with a black dude. Do you know the, the black male's name? I think it's Gerald. What else do you know about Nick? He normally carries a 38 or a 9 mil. Has he ever gotten into it with your brother before? They argue about a lot of stupid stuff. Nick's really, he <laughs> seems like he's crazy. I wouldn't really want to mess with him. Jonathan Ross said Nicholas Nairn was 23 years old, um, a small time drug dealer who, who was out of work. All the links with the Red Dodge pickup truck, the history between the two of them, the subject being armed on a regular basis. That obviously then at that point propelled Nicholas Nairn to being the suspect that we were looking for. Before we entered the room to interview Nick, he was sleeping. This referred to as the perp nap. Someone who's typically guilty will actually fall asleep in the interrogation room because they're so exhausted from the stress associated with waiting to be arrested. Nick, right? Yes, sir. Good well. I'm Detective Barnett. This is Detective Parsons. Mm -hmm. okay. I'm going to sleep. That's Athens. It's okay. <clears throat> you have any idea what this is about? I don't know, it's um, gunpoint, got on the car, got out of the car. Yeah, but do you know what, anything that, you have an idea what left that? No, not. Now, when you were stopped, you had a couple of guns on you? Mm-hmm. I was going to go to shooting range. I just put, turned the corner, and the lights went on. Okay. Well, while we're here, we're investigating something that happened earlier tonight. And we're wondering if you could tell us what happened tonight. With you? I went at night. Um, I was at home for the longest time. Is there any reason that your truck would have been at the CVS around the corner tonight? No. It shouldn't have been. Then how was it there? I don't know. <clears throat> the reason that it was there mm -hmm. is because something happened there. Okay. He's very engaged right now. He's up at the table. He's close in. He's in a very strong position. 
And at first, I'm back. So I move in to show that I also have a very firm position in my assertion that his vehicle is there. If it seems as though I'm not sure, he'll take that and he'll run with it. And that allows him to have an escape. You had three guns on you tonight. Yeah, one person, yeah. Did you fire any of them tonight? No. Okay. Well, let's just say, for example, that maybe it's not one of the three that you had on you. It doesn't alleviate the fact that you were there when shots are fired. You were what? You were involved in something at night at that location. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to hear your side of what happened there. When he's feeling threatened, he starts to back up. And the hand that he's able to actually goes into his pocket. So it's another defense mechanism that he's using where he's hiding and concealing what actually happened. You can choose <coughs> to be deceptive all you want, OK? I have no but reason me, to be on this side of town. Me, the point about you. This, this thing is this, is that you were there because people wrote down the tag number of your truck there, OK? No, the truck shouldn't have been there. Wasn't my possession. It was there. Wasn't in my possession though. But you were there. I wasn't there. Yeah, you were. How do you know that? Video cameras? Did you see me in my vehicle? You kind of just did. So I'm guessing that thing had the full video around the whole camera? Around the whole store? I'm not. I'm not even. Only there's video everywhere, because there's not. At that point, I didn't have video of the shooting, but he's nodding, because now he believes it. So with him, I felt comfortable throwing out the bluff in such a way because I didn't think he was going to call me on it, and I thought he would accept it. I lost him. That explains why it comes right in my ass. Does lying help you? Lying will never be <laughs> Stop it. Why did you do what you did? Put the truth. Yes. Motherfucker's a okay? That's straight up honesty. Motherfucker's a Okay, he deserved it. He researched at nothing. He shot the motherfucker's face. He made a uh noise. I shot him. No mind. That's it. His true face comes out, and it comes out in grand fashion. We were speechless. He just didn't care. It was just, it was pure evil. They were like, the day of consequences, we need to do this. Yeah, you right. I fed up because I used my truck and the camera. From the very beginning of this investigation, it was a whodunit. And within hours, we had the suspect in custody. We had a confession. We had him charged. And he was on his way to jail. Nick Nearing was sentenced to life in prison. That confession showed that he planned to kill Joseph from the very beginning. And it showed his mindset that he did not care. There's no chance of Nick getting out ever. He'll die in prison, and that's probably best because I do believe that he would kill again if he had the chance. Was on patrol and I heard the call come over dispatch. Green Drive, I have a female with stab wounds. Attention, ambulance. Ambulance is needed. You could tell by the tone of her voice that it wasn't normal. Sabrina has a 12 inch bread knife that she is holding in her right hand. She's covered in blood. I could see blood on the blade. I can see blood on her. Immediately, we started screaming to drop the knife. It almost like snapped her out of whatever she was in back to some type of reality. I kicked it away from her, and we put her down on the floor. It was a very tense couple seconds. The suspect, Sabrina Zunich, she was a 18-year-old foster child of Lisa Knafel. Also inside the house was Megan Stanella and Haley Knafel. Megan being 13 and Haley being three years old. The father, Kevin, was away on a trip 
he was a truck driver, and he was in Michigan at that point. Sabrina was in foster care for many years before she came to the Knafels. Sabrina landing with the Knafels really represented a fresh start for her. She went from a troubled home with her biological father and grandma to a youth shelter where she did not want to be. She's getting along with the family. She's doing great at school. She's not getting in trouble. Things seem to be looking up for her. I couldn't find anything indicating something like this could happen. Our main goal when we first interviewed Sabrina was to get Sabrina to tell us exactly what happened. We caught her coming out of the room, so we knew she did it. We wanted to know why. So what, uh, what do you recall? From yesterday? Mm-hmm. Getting done with my homework? Going, I don't know, and that's it. Mm-hmm. So what was that? And we were at home? Mm-hmm. Would anything unusual happen? I don't know. How, how do you get along with Kevin? Kevin and me are cool. Mm -hmm. I mean, he's more of the one that helps me out. Mm -hmm. Because there's nothing I can deal with. And so we made agreements a long time ago that if I need anything, that I can go to Kevin. How about, well, with Lisa? How do you feel about her? Me and Lisa have never been the best. Mm -hmm. She's never seemed to like me, and she's been wanting me out of the house. What's your thoughts on how Lisa is not alive now? What? Well, I see you had a knife. And you stabbed Lisa. So. I did. Missed it. And, and, and Megan called the police. It didn't give me true. Three, it is. I'm sorry. This is really dead. The yeah. is dead. Sorry. I don't believe this. Nobody else was hurt. Nobody else was hurt. Thank goodness. Sabrina never denies committing the murder. She just acts confused when I tell her that she's the one who killed Lisa Knafel. We could have waited here for four days, and we were probably going to get the same answer from her. We made the decision that we're just going to cut this down because she's not going to give us anything else that we need. I was hoping to find some text messages, some emails, some search history as to why this crime took place. Over the past several weeks, Kevin Knafel and Sabrina text messaged each other over 1,000 times. I did not think it was normal for a foster father and a foster daughter to have thousands of text messages between the two of them. We were confident that Kevin left for work at 8 p.m. the night before the murder, and he didn't get back into town until after Lisa's death. So we wanted to know from his perspective as to if there was any argument going on at the house before he left. And then you told me you wanted to talk about his wife's work. Correct. That's the subject matter. Yeah. So. I told his lawyer that we would just talk about the work, but I was hoping that maybe he would open up and give us some insight as to um, what was going on and what, why the reason that this happened. Kevin, do you know anything that was happening at the house the night before you left for work that night? 
Well, hang on a second. We just talked about talking about his wife's work. What's going on at the house the night before is not his wife's work. Okay. Where does your wife work at? Cuyahoga County Children's Family Services. What does she do there? She was a social worker for the um, children's section of the school. He was looking down. There was no uh, tears. Um, there was no anger. Were you and uh, Lisa in the process of going through a divorce? Okay, now we're getting outside the uh, scope. Kevin Knafel was not willing to help the police in finding out exactly what happened to his wife. Why is he not cooperating with us? What is he hiding from us? So a proffer is a good faith first step uh, when the defense attorney, the prosecution, meet with the suspect. It's an opportunity for them to be 100% complete, honest, and tell exactly what happened. It's a first step into a plea agreement. We cannot use this against her in court. What we believe from conversations is that what led up to this homicide, to this murder, is that there was another party involved in planning that. Yes. Was Kevin Knafel, my foster father. It was Kevin's idea, and it was talked about after we were having sexual relations, and him and Lisa were having problems in marriage. He wanted to get a divorce, but Haley, which is a three-year-old daughter of his and her, was in the picture, and he wanted full custody. She would get custody, or it would be shared and he didn't want that happening. So the alternative was for this to happen. When was it after you started to live there on a daily basis that your relationship with Kevin changed? When did the sexual nature start to change? Um, it all started not with sex, but with massages because he was a truck driver and his legs would cramp, so it was in her thigh. Then it progressively got into sex. Does he ever tell you, hey, you can't tell anybody about this? All the time. Did he say what would happen if you told Then you'd be taken out of my care and I could lose my foster parent license. What did you say in response to that? I would never do that. Okay. Tell on him. As Sabrina and Kevin's relationship continued, Sabrina described the increasing tension she felt from Lisa and that Sabrina felt that she wasn't welcome in the house anymore. So Kevin convinced Sabrina that if she did kill Lisa and did get caught, that she would only do two to five years, that he would protect her, and that after she got out, that he would be there with her. They would buy a house, and basically she can be like a mother figure to Haley. So have you talked to him since No. Then? Not on no money on my books, no letters, no calls, no nothing. Nothing? Nothing. That's when we learned that Kevin helped plan this murder. It was calculated and essentially Kevin using Sabrina to get his wife out of the picture and to collect life insurance money. Sabrina's childhood, I believe, is probably the most important thing to understand why something like this could happen. Sabrina had never experienced a stable family, a loving household, the sense of security, the sense of belonging. Kevin seemed to know how to prey on Sabrina's vulnerabilities. In my opinion, the verdict came very quickly. The jury came up with a guilty verdict. I believe it took a matter of about two days.
Who's calling 911? Where is your emergency? Um, it's like a non-emergency. We want to like report a missing person. Report what? A missing person. It's my sister. How old is she? She's 25. And what is her name? Samira Watkins. Where was the last place you saw her? The last place I seen her was um, Thursday night around 8 o'clock. Right, we're getting an officer over there to you. Samira's sister said that the night Samira went missing, Samira worked a shift at her job. She went home. She changed her clothes. She let her sister know that she was going over to talk to her boyfriend, Zachary Littleton, and that she would be home later that night. She was never seen or heard from again. So it just made sense to go ahead and talk to Zachary Littleton as quickly as possible to see whether or not Samir had actually made it to his apartment. He could very well be the last person that had seen her. You'll have a seat here. I'll be right back, OK? Zachary Littleton was a 24-year-old member of the United States Navy. He was stationed here in Pensacola at Pensacola Naval Air Station. And Littleton was Samir's boyfriend. What's your full name? God-given birth name? Zachary Antoine Littleton. What's your um, address? Um, I was standing at 3500 Crane Road at the apartment, but I moved the last two days. Because my wife and my daughter, she'll, they'll be here to, in, in Friday, the 6th. She was stationed in Goose Creek, and I'm stationed here, so the Navy decided to put us together, so we... Oh, so you're both in the Navy? Right. Where's Goose Creek, South Carolina? So y'all finally get to be together. Cool. That's really good. We learned Zachary Littleton was married to an enlisted Navy sailor who lived out of town and was caring for their child. Littleton was a bit of a, a playboy. That's easily a, an indicator of somebody that's flat out a liar and who probably will lie about other things. So you know the reason why you're here, we had that discussion on over the phone about uh, Sammy going missing. You know her as, as Sammy? Yeah. Um, but you've had some dealings with her and you've talked to her. Yeah, she's been over to the house like maybe four or five times. Would she kick it or whatever, but, you know, it wasn't nothing really a relationship. It was just friends that what I thought it was. So you've known her for how long then? A few months. Not a whole year. It's been a few months. Did your wife know that you were talking to this girl? No. Okay. Would that be a problem if she knew that? No, because she knew, she knew I have a lot of friends. Did you have any kind of a relationship with Sammy that was more than just friends? No. I need you to tell me exactly when you saw her last. When it's definitely Wednesday. Yeah. Wednesday, somebody dropped off. So I was like, why are you coming just popping up in my house like that? And I was like, you know what? You can, you can, you need to leave. All right, and she was, she was getting like attacked, so I just told him, I'm married, I got a daughter, so why? Why should it, it was good while it lasted, and you knew it from the gate, you knew it from the beginning that you weren't gonna be the woman in my life, and that's when I took her home. Does it strike you as odd that we're here talking about her? Uh, it strikes me, yeah, because uh, now she's missing, and it I don't scream out, but it messes me up. How does it mess you up? Cause how is that possible? I mean, I didn't do it. Do I, it. I, I, anything. I'm not responsible for her being missed. Uh, I hate her for her because she was a nice person. She wasn't no feisty type or no. She had good tendencies to be a good woman. There was a period during the interview where Zachary Littleton would refer to Samira in the past tense. She was this or she was that. I, I, that struck me as odd. At this point, she is missing, but she could be any number of places and be perfectly fine. Littleton had definitely not relieved my suspicions of him, nor did he lead me to where she was at. And as he left, I felt like he very well could be responsible for Samira's disappearance.
we learned Samira Watkins had recently become pregnant. Samira's family made it very clear that Littleton definitely knew she was pregnant and that the baby was his. Her family said that Zachary Littleton was not happy about this information. Zachary Littleton was so against her pregnancy that he encouraged her to get an abortion. On the morning of November 3rd, some jet skiers found a large duffel bag that was washed up on shore of a waterway very close to Pensacola uh, Naval Air Station. The bag had a foul odor coming from it. There was insect activity on and around it, and there was even blood that was seeping out of the bag. When the sheriff's office got there and they opened it up, they did find a body of a female inside of that bag, deceased. She had no clothing on except a bra, and she was curled up in the fetal position inside of the duffel bag. A latent fingerprint examiner was able to conduct a fingerprint comparison on site and they were able to report that indeed this was Samira Watkins. We later learned that cause of death was asphyxiation, uh, most likely a strangulation. It completely changed the whole look of the investigation. It was now a homicide and Littleton was our main suspect. When we opened the bag, there's a few things that we learned. First and foremost, she was missing an earring. When Samira went missing, we knew that she had been wearing both earrings because we obtained the video surveillance from her employer. Finding that second earring would be so important. If I found it in the possession of an individual, they would certainly be potentially the killer. There was also a couple of paper towels in the bag. You could clearly see that it had a distinct pattern on it. During that search, we found some key pieces of evidence. We did find a roll of paper towels that matched exactly the print of the paper towel found inside the bag with Samira. But the biggest thing found at Littleton's house was that matching earring, the earring we'd been looking for. That was a direct link between the victim, the scene, and the suspect. Any doubt that I had, which wasn't much, was now eliminated. I knew that Zachary Littleton was our killer. Zachary Littleton was sentenced to life in prison without parole. Justice was served. This was such a tragic case and involved a young mother and her unborn child. And because of that, there was a special sense of desire to do justice for them. I remember it being brutally cold. I got there pretty quick. A black pickup was lodged against a tree. We've all got our high-powered flashlights, and we're all on our hands and knees trying to find evidence. At the bottom of the ditch, very hastily covered with some leaves and a stick, there was a body of a young male. There were multiple gunshot wounds. I received a phone call from the dispatch that a body had been found next to a pickup in a ditch on a road is known as Substation Road. On the way, I was hearing radio traffic of a possible suspect could be walking down the road north of that. So I kind of decided to check it out on the way, and I came across an individual walking northbound on the highway. He's wearing a suit with a white shirt with tie, had a trench coat on, and I found that odd at that time of the morning. I made a quick U-turn in behind him. He spun around 
Um, not knowing whether he had a weapon or not, I drew him a weapon and ordered him on the ground. And I said, I'm going to ask you one time, do you have a weapon on you? And he said, no, but I am the guy you're trying to find. I'm the guy that killed the guy on Substation Road. My name is Undersheriff J.T. Palmer. Me and you met on the side of Highway 177 in about Sing Road at about 312 this morning, didn't we? Yes, sir. Okay, and what do you remember telling me? Uh, in summation that I'm guilty, yes. Of what? Of murder. Okay, and who did you murder? Uh, Gennaro. I do not know how to spell that, but it is with a G. Okay, and then how did you murder him? With a gun. I shot him in the head twice. And do you go to school with him? Yes, sir. Was that his pickup or your pickup? I'm fairly sure it was his, sir. Okay, and do you remember what kind of pickup that was? Uh, black. Okay, now. And how did you guys hook up? I went down to his dorm room and asked if I could be given a ride to Walmart in exchange for $20 gas money. We pulled into the parking lot, then I pulled the uh, weapon on him and demanded that he take me to Asher, Oklahoma, sir. And why did all of a sudden did you decide that you needed to go to Asher? Because I was planning to take him out into the country and kill him. And so I guess at some point, did you decide it was... Now was the time? Yes, sir. Uh, shot once, missed. Shot a second time, hit, jumped out of the car, went around. He was driving 10, 15 miles an hour, so it was out until he already had hit the tree. I heard him uh, gurgling. Uh, I'm not sure if that was a physiological or physical process after death, but uh, I thought that he might have still lived through that somehow because he was gurgling, so I shot him again and then shoved him down in the ditch. And then I tried to cover it, uh, admittedly not well, with uh, leaves, dirt, and uh, stick. And so, after you got the body covered up, what did you do then? I uh, headed back to the truck and uh, tried to get it unstuck. And so you could get the truck out, so what did you do then? Then I walked away. I headed north. And in my mind, I'm thinking, wow. And I never had interviewed anybody that had been that cold and callous. You killed a young man? Yes, sir. Why did you do it? If I'm pressed to answer, I'll say it's to prove the strength of my resolve. But that's only if I'm pressed to answer. I'm not pressing you. I'm just trying to understand. Then I don't know why. OK. So it just popped in my head. And why him? Uh, all the kids in college here, why, why you? I believed that he would have had the least impact, sir. Impact of what? Uh, I believed he didn't have many friends, or many close friends, I should rephrase. His absence would be less notable. You don't think her family would miss him? You don't think she's going to be upset, heartbroken? I think she will be, sir. How does that make you feel? No different, sir. Or are you going to kill anybody else? No, sir. Tell me why I should believe you that there just was going to be one person that was going to suffer from your consequences of killing. You have no reason to believe me, sir. Do you feel any remorse? No. What do you think should happen to you? Death sentence, sir. And why do you think you deserve death sentence? An eye for an eye, sir. a lot of interviews and I've had them where they're crying and they're upset they get mad he didn't he looked you right in the eye on every question probably the only interview that I ever did that the hair kind of stood up on the back of my neck this is pure evil talking to me
Jared Murray's defense counsel had him evaluated. They very quickly found him to meet the clinical, the legal findings of not guilty by reason of, of insanity. Antisocial personality disorder. The characteristics are a flat effect, a lack of empathy, a lack of impulse control, and a bunch of other things that fit Gerard Murray to a T. Gerard Murray was going to a secure facility where the high risk, the very dangerous people that are found not guilty by reason of insanity are sent. But 15 years from now, he's going to learn how to play the system. He's a highly intelligent and highly dangerous man. Is there a chance he can be released? Absolutely, he can. I was angry. I was livid. He's not in the place where he should be. He should be in prison. He's had the taste for blood. He got away with it once. And so he would try to do it again. I think that if he ever got out, everybody around him would be in danger because you just don't know what would set him off. The law changed. This protects everybody. My son's life had meaning, and his death will have meaning. Our dispatch had received a call of a possible body that had been wrapped in a tarp. A lady who lives in the neighborhood was out taking her dog for a walk, as she always did. And the dog started pulling to the wood line in this area called Clark Sand Pit. It used to be a pond where they mined sediment. So there's this giant dead end a lot of people use that area for dumping just random stuff simply because it's not an area where people live. The first thing you could uh, notice when you got down there was the smell. Decomposition of a human body, once you smell it, is something that you never forget. Almost adjacent from the body in the roadway was a half sheet like it had been broken in half of sheetrock. And the sheetrock had a good tire impression. And there was also a visible footprint. There was also orange twine that didn't appear to be weathered. So if an object had been left out there for a long time, there would have been weathering to it. We kind of put two and two together to determine that these objects probably or more likely all came together during the time of the body dump. We initially observe this white male that is bound with duct tape, not only on his body, his hands, but what was very distinguishable was he had duct tape wrapped all the way around his face. You could still see that the fingerprints were intact. So we had crime scene uh, taken inked impression. We rushed it back to our uh, fingerprint lab, and they were able to ID him as a Charles Lock. When we arrived, we noticed it was basically unkept. A lot of grown up shrub and bushes around there. We go try to make contact. We couldn't get anybody to come to the door. So after attempting contact at Charles Locke's residence, we observed that teeter-tottering both properties of uh, Charles Locke and his neighbor was a trash can. And in that trash can, we observed some broken sheetrock as well as those orange pies that we had also seen at the scene. A light bulb came on at that time. I mean, could this just be a coincidence or are we kind of on to something? We don't know at this point whether Calvin Allison's a witness or a suspect. 
But given the fact that we do have items that are at his residence, which are also at the scene, there is a good possibility he was a suspect. What's up, Nicole? Not much. My name's Investigator Alvarez, Sergeant Lawrence. Calvin Allison was a transplant from Oklahoma to Pensacola. He brought his wife and his two children down here. He worked for the local uh, utility company. Did my wine coffee? I made some coffee. No, I don't like he just seemed like your typical good old country boy. I did find it odd during the interview that he was so calm. A lot of times in uh, murder cases, people are immediately curious to why they're there, and they want to provide an alibi. I mean, we spent a tremendous amount of time before we even brought up Charles Locke, for the most part. How long have you known Charles for? Mm, we met him. A little bit after we moved in, we talked to him a couple of times, but then we didn't really start talking to him until when his wife left him. And he came over, and when, my wife's... I'm sorry, when did his wife leave him, by the way? A year, year and a half ago. Okay. Did he come over frequently, or did you guys go over there frequently to see him, or were those uh, About once a week, we would take him a plate if we cooked out, mm -hmm. but he would come over sometimes and sit down. He came over for Thanksgiving and Christmas dinner, we came over. When was the last time you had seen Charles? Sunday night, when I took him to the plate, I took him a pork chop dinner. We cooked on the grill. Investigator Alvarez does a great job of just getting that buy-in from him. And the whole time this is going on, I'm starting to receive texts and phone calls from my guys that are giving me bits of information from the scene. The first thing that, um, investigators noticed was that there was a medium-sized pool of blood there in uh, the living room area. As they made their way throughout the house, there was another area that the carpet was saturated in blood, and there appeared to be drag marks that they had also located across the carpet. So when that initial evidence is found, okay, we have the location where this crime occurred. How did your tire, your left front tire, because you have four different tires on that truck, your left front tire's cupped. Okay, you know what that is, right? Cupped, all right, it's when you ran over the sheetrock, it left uh, the black, tire marks on there that matches your tire. Now either you got some <laughs> luck, okay? I didn't, I didn't do it. I, who did it? I, I can't tell you, but no. I didn't do it. But you were there. I wasn't there. Calvary. I've been at work and with. As the investigators are going through the house, there was evidence that indicated Mr. Uh, Locke might be living an alternative lifestyle and like to dress up as a female. There were bras, panties, all types of women's clothes. So then we start thinking, OK, what if when Mr. Allison comes over to his house to bring him food or something of that nature. Does Charles Locke make a pass at him or say something ordinary, you know, in a suggestive sexual way? Charles has a, a little uh, fetish that a lot of people don't know about. I think Charles come on to you. No. It went bad. If that's the case, I can buy that. That never happened. OK. Then, then I, man, I'm telling you, I'm all ears. I'll take notes. You tell me. When Sergeant Barnes presented that topic of Charles Locke's sexuality, it was kind of a shot in the dark. A lot of times, we might throw out a theory that, you know, we might not know it's 100% factual or not, because at this point, we have a body dump. We know there's foul play. And we just needed to be able to place Calvin Allison as the individual who did it. It didn't matter the circumstances behind it for the most part. I need to know what happened, Calvin. Otherwise, we're in a bad situation, buddy. 
I think maybe Charles did something that he wasn't supposed to do. And I think Charles dead because of that. Now, listen to your boss, okay? Calvin, look at me. He started to get lower and lower and drop down, at which point I placed my hand onto his leg. It was almost like saying it's okay to come off of this and that, you know, by telling the truth, you know, all this stress and all this anxiety and all this pent up, you know, negative energy you have, it's going to go away. Tell me what happened, buddy. I ain't here to mess you up or anything, man. I need to know what happened over there. Try to kiss me. Try to kiss you. Grab me. You know, push him down. I don't know. I don't think he hit his head on the I don't know what it was. The blood was coming out. That's okay, Cal. No, it's not okay. Once I saw he started opening up, I packed my stuff up. I knew that Investigator Alvarez had him. There was no need for me to be in there. I felt like just because I had been a little more confrontational that he might hold back some. something bad. Why? I took him the food. I want to set it down in the kitchen. He made a pass at me and I pushed him and he fell. His head, blood went everywhere and I panicked. What do you mean he made a pass at you? He tried to kiss me. Calvin, like, why would you not have called 911? It was an accident. So what are you being charged with right now? I don't know. Oh, my God, Calvin. Hold on, Florida, it's called the justifiable use of deadly force and justifiable use of non-deadly force. And it was a theory that the defense obviously went with because they said he tried to kiss him and made a move. And maybe in his mind, he was trying to come up with an excuse of why, what happened and why it happened. You know, personally, I, I don't believe him. Um, and just because Sergeant Barnes kind of gave him that story as an out. And there was more evidence that was developed later on, you know, which obviously made the case a lot stronger. I think he took out $800 one day and then $600 the other two days. We may never know what happened. I don't believe it was because he tried to kiss him. I believe there was something more than that I don't believe that story. Calvin Allison did not just come up with that and say, this is what happened. I felt like the reason Calvin gave for what happened was really prompted by the information that the detectives were giving him. Nine one one. What's your emergency? Yeah, uh, I'm at 885 Yale Farm Road. I think I need an ambulance. Okay, what's going on? The truck fell on my stepson. The truck fell on your stepson? Yes, and we just got home, and I don't think he's alive. Okay, he's pinned underneath the uh, truck? Yeah, my husband's lifting up the truck. His chest is crushed. His chest is crushed? Oh, my God. <laughs> Thank you.
Levi was 23 when he died. He had left behind two young kids uh, and was trying to make a, a life for himself after a troubled childhood. Levi married very young. He was a hardworking young man, worked hard to support his family. And I think most people would say, unfortunate, what a tragedy. A 23-year-old boy is killed for no reason. She said she had heard from Carl's second wife, Cindy Carlson, and that Cindy had told her that she had left her husband and that she was afraid he was gonna come after her and that she believed that her husband had killed his son, Levi. It was really kind of hearsay at that point, but we decided to take another look at it nonetheless. Seventeen days before the death of Levi, Carl takes Levi up to a bank, and he takes out a life insurance policy on Levi, but with a rider that makes the value of life insurance policy of seven hundred thousand dollars. When I first reviewed the report from two thousand and eight, there was no mention of an insurance policy. Of that money, Carl just spent money freely and didn't put away any savings for Levi's kids. We realized we need to take a look at this Carl Carlson and see what this person's really like. In 1991, Carl and Christina lived with their three children in a very small house on a very rural property in the woods. Carl said that the children were down for a nap and that Christina was taking a bath. Carl was out in a work shed and he hears the screams. He just said he managed to rescue his children and pull them out of their windows of their bedrooms but he was driven back by the flames and the heat when he tried to rescue his wife. I put a call into the investigator that was very passionate about the case back then, and he literally almost broke down crying when he received my call. Oh my God, I always dreamed that someday, someday this call would come, and here it is. Carl gave three different versions of what happened that day, how that fire started. He was a volunteer firefighter at one point, so he has some knowledge of fire. He claimed that the dog had knocked over a jug of kerosene. Later, he said that this light blew out. There's different stories as to what the cause was, but it was suspicious. Carl claims that he had boarded this window up because the window was broken. Uh, he used 17 nails. Christina had a $150,000 life insurance policy on her at the time of her death. Carl got the money and, and used it largely to finance his move back to New York and kind of start over again uh, with the kids. The investigator said he was told, Carl went to New York, he's New York's problem now, and we're not putting the money into this case anymore. Just let it go. But he then said that he photocopied every single record, and they're in a box in my basement. Oh. 
Go ahead and have a seat. Right. Want me to take care of paperwork real quick? Will you do that? Or you want to be here for that? That's all right. I'll just go ahead and take care of this. If you want to start? Yeah. The onset is simply to focus on the death of Levi Carlson. I was very nervous uh, because so much was was relying on this this interview, and there was a lot at stake here. If he is the person we think he is, then other people are at risk. Tell us about it. The day that my son died, yeah. her and I, we had a funeral to go to. Left at 11.30, quarter 12, somewhere like that. It was on the other side of Seneca Lake. Um, son was there. He helped me. We were working on the truck changing the transmission lines, brake lines, the whole nine yard. Um, went in, gave him some money, left. Went in where? Went in the garage, okay? And um, so we got done with, you know, talked to him, said goodbye. And um, so then we uh, left, come back a little after four, and went out there and found him. What do you mean you found him? I found him dead. The truck was on them. Um, they come in, tried doing CPR, mm -hmm. and he was already gone. Um, went down to the hospital. Um, we weren't at all surprised he was sticking his story. You know, a lie stuck to becomes the truth, right? If he doesn't falter off that, it makes it difficult for us to put the case together. We talked to us, nothing else is working, we can try some deception. Now, when you use deception in an interview, it's allowable to a point, but where that point is is in a gray area, so you're taking a risk when you do it. There is a big problem. Now, we already knew there was no concrete time of death on this case. Tom came up with this concept that through medical technology, we were able to tell the, exactly what time he died, and we knew what time Carl had left. And I wish I could say he died in your presence. But when you walk back in there, if you're being, if you're telling us the truth and saying you had a conversation with him, you're lying because he was dead at that no, time. No, I had a conversation with him, I'll tell you that. Okay. Well, he was, he was either dead when you walked in there no. or as you walked out. That's fact. You're feeling the pressure and you are not able to tell the truth right now. If you really truly felt like you, what you did was right, and which I think you did I, in a minute. All right, I, I did not kill Levi. There's no way I could have. But he was dead when I went in there. Okay. Tell us about that. You're doing great, buddy. I think he's not crying here. He's trying to put on a show for the camera and for all of us that he's emotional here. But the walls are closing on him. That's what his body language is telling us. Do you mind if I stand back up again? John's connection with Carl is almost like a father-son relationship that started early on into this interview. We know that we have our best opportunity to get to the truth by leaving John in that room alone. I let him down. I walked away. And I lived with that for four years. You know, you guys somehow, you know, pulled that out of me. And in a way, it's been a relief. Good. It should be relief. But I could never hurt him. I couldn't. You did. It's all right. Come on. You're that close, man. You're close. Come on. Let it out. Let it out. I could tell. He's, re he's ready to tell me something really big here. And um, gave him all the encouragement I could. Come on. I'll walk with you if you do. What are you going to do for me? I'm going to stand up and say this wasn't premeditated, cold-blooded murder. That it was just something that happened. It happens sometimes, Carl. That's what I'll do for you. I opened the truck door. Okay. When they did it.
<laughs> and if I'd hit the f box underneath it, it wouldn't have happened. Carl, what was that accent? Why did you try and hide it? <laughs> He comes out with his final version that he caused the truck to fall on his son and then basically walked out and left him dying on the floor. Carl Carlson is a sociopath, pathetic human being, and he was a budding serial killer. I think he derived the high from murder. I think he enjoyed it. This wasn't a job, this case. This was about Levi. This was about Christina. It was about all the people that got their lives destroyed by Carl Carlson. The scary part was he took out life insurance policies on his two granddaughters. It's insane to even think that you could take out a policy like that and not inform the mother, but he did it. And um, I have no doubt they were next. We located the victim in her living room. She was lying on her couch, face up, and appeared to be wearing a night robe. She was laying in an odd position. It appeared that a struggle had taken place. There were several things at the scene that weren't adding up. Most of the house was neat and in order, except for the room where the victim was found. The robe sash did appear to be in an odd place. It was lying on the floor near Patricia's hand, not around the robe like you would typically see a robe worn. The victim's vehicle was missing. According to the neighbors, nobody would have had permission to take the vehicle. Another thing missing from the house was a television set from the second floor. The fact that there were no signs of forced entry, we did have a theory that this might be somebody the victim would have had known and had access to the house. We're photographing, we're looking for physical evidence, Every little detail can make a difference in a case like this. When I spoke to Daniel Dresser, he told us that there had been a break-in, and the person that Patricia suspected committed the break-in was Spencer Spielman. Spencer had been a friend of Patricia's other son, Nick Dresser, for quite a while. And Daniel Dresser told us that Spencer had approached Patricia asking for money. So Patricia would give Spencer money for helping out around the house, uh, helping with the artwork. And Patricia had given him a garage code to get in the house. She started noticing things missing, and she started getting a really weird feeling. Wednesday prior to her death, she said, you know, Spencer keeps bugging me about wanting Nick's really nice watch. She said, I've really hit it in a great place. He'll never find it. Patty told me about Spencer stealing a few things when she wasn't home, and she thought he was looking for that watch. So she started texting him. And she was pretty mad about it. She also was texting her son, Daniel, about what was going on. And one of her texts was, I'm feeling a little scared. This is the type of kid. Yeah, you can sit down, man. Um, <laughs> Tell me why you think you're here. Honestly, I have no idea. Okay. Um, and, and I, I mean, obviously the car. Okay. How do you let me use it? Okay. 
Right, well, that's what we need to get to the bottom of. I go over there to her house once or twice a week. And then we're, we're talking about... I... Pat, Pat. Are you Patty? And uh, I like clean her house and stuff. Like she pays me like $100 once a month to do all her windows. Okay. Like clean her floors. All that. First impression of Spencer is he's just nonchalant. No respect for anybody. He didn't have a care in the world. Can y'all just please tell me what's going on? Burglary. We'll give you the opportunity to tell us. We know the answer. Burglary? What are you talking about, burglary? Stolen car. I didn't steal no car. I was trying to get him agitated. Sometimes when you get somebody mad, you know, you get a different reaction. Go here, go there, go for the throat. What the is going on? Murder. Bull Bull Murder. I didn't kill nobody. Well, apparently you did. The f You sit here and lie about everything else. Why would you lie about that? You stole her car. No. What? Just broke in her house, stole her TV. No. Stole a car, stole her my five. I didn't kill nobody. Right, or steal you anything. Then you better tell us who did. I don't know. Yeah, right. You better, you I don't better have the balls us. to murder anybody. Maybe you didn't mean to. What? I didn't tell us to try to save your life. You. We were getting nowhere. So we got to try something different here. So we were getting ready to have a little break. You want a cigarette, right? Sure. I took Spencer outside to go smoke a cigarette. You want to go right at that exit door? It was all video recorded on a body ward camera to make sure there was nothing said or no promises made or no coercion or anything like that. Got him out of the room for a minute for a reset. And once we walked out the door, we did not talk about this case at all. He was kind of looking out into the darkness. And I don't know if that gave him an opportunity to see that we were actually human. After the smoke break, we walked back in. I put him in the chair, and he looks at me, and he says, I'm ready to tell y'all what happened. So I get Mike, and I'm like, Hey, come on. He said he's ready to, to give it to us, and, and everybody's mouth just was open and all. At least you got a cigarette, man. Mm. When I let her down on the couch, like, a few minutes later, she just came up freaking the f out, hitting me, and trying to scratch at me, and, and I just... Left. I came back, and by that time, I took it. When I took it off, it was too late. I was shocked. I was shocked, but after he ended up confessing, I, it was that relief that that we did get the truth. satisfied with the way the outcome was. At the end of the day, we're speaking for Patricia. You have to stay resilient and uh, determined to, to find the truth. And in this case, we were able to provide justice to Patricia and give her family answers. Patty Dresser was 52 when her life was taken away. I, I think about her every day and I miss her every day.
Alec Kruger had called 911 and reported that there had been an intruder at his residence and that his parents had been shot. You hear what sounds like a possible gunshot, and then the call goes dead. Coming up to the house, there really wasn't any indication of anything gone wrong. As you go up the stairs is the main bedroom or the master bedroom. Alec was found lying on the bed, and Tracy was on the floor on the opposite side of the bed in that main bedroom. Tracy Kruger and Alec Kruger were both deceased and appeared to have multiple gunshot wounds. Hillary Kruger had suffered a gunshot wound, and she was in very critical condition. So when I first drove up that night, there were two vehicles stuck at the end of the driveway, just east of the residence. You could see that both were stuck uh, backwards in the ditch, like they had spun out. We were trying to figure out the two vehicles in the ditch. What is the relationship? Was Tracy Kruger or somebody else from the family down here on the road at some point? There was a little blue, like, toe strap sticking out from the front of the pickup. There was a single set of footprints leaving the vehicles. The license plates were run on the vehicles, and that's what told us that one was registered to Michael Zabawa, and the other one was registered to the Kruger family. At that point, we are going to want to talk to Michael Zabawa. We had not processed the crime scene to any degree at that point. We hadn't been able to gather much information from the scene or any witnesses. Our plan to interview him certainly was just, you know, gather information about his timeline of events. That's what I'm asking you to do right now, is tell Trevor and I the truth about where you were last night. Uh -huh. You were at home. I was at home. Right. And what I'm concerned about is we found your truck, OK? We, I told you on the way up here, we, we uh -huh. know that it's in the ditch. We also found a stolen truck, OK? Another pickup not far from your house, OK? that was stolen close to where your truck was. We know you were out last night. Where were you drinking at? I mean, you know you're drinking. You already told me you're drinking. What difference does it make if you tell me where at? So I can, you know what I mean? Where were you drinking at? Um, where is, where are In town here? Yeah. In Wasika? Yeah. OK. Were you drinking with friends, by yourself? With a friend. Mr. Zabawa on the car ride in, he indicated that he had been at work the previous day, and then he went home and that he was home all evening. And he said he was drinking at home alone. As the interview progressed, his story slowly changed. OK. What time did you stay there till? Yeah, it was about 10 to 11. OK, then where'd you go? Went back to his place and then went OK. How did your truck end up in the ditch, though? You're, did you leave your house again, or where, where's that? No, oh, I, I went home. Yeah. <laughs> OK, but, but you see, Mike, where the problem lies here? The stolen truck. Are your fingerprints going to be in it? No. You sure of that? Yeah. OK. Um, these are the shoes you were wearing last night? Yes, they are. Are these footprints going to match the uh, footprints in the snow by the stolen truck? No. So when a suspect gives you that kind of confident answer that, no, you're not going to get me on this, or you're not going to trip me up on this issue, it does kind of make you set back a little bit and try to figure out, where am I going to go with this now? OK. Um, I did check on a couple things, um, Mike. And uh, basically, I talked to one of my partners, and he uh, he's interviewed your mom. Okay. Initially, you said you were at home from 5 o'clock on. Well, that's not true. Yeah. Then you said you were home at 11. Well, that's not true. You see what I mean? And your mom says she heard you come in around 3.30 in the morning. Tell us the real story. We left the bar. It was probably... It was closed. It was about 1.30. 1, 30, somewhere in there. Went to Eric's house. Sat there. That was probably... They had a few more beers at his place. Um, I left there, it was about 
2.30 Okay. Then where did you go? Uh -huh. Okay. Now we're back to where we were again. Uh -huh. We were kind of stuck in a, a pattern of this, you know, incremental admissions. We didn't feel that we had anything to lose at that point by trying another tactic. Introducing a new face, he may react differently. Hey, hey, how you guys doing? Good. Mike? This is Gene Weatherman. He's another agent with the State Crime Bureau, okay? Hey, I've been uh, monitoring your your conversations as you guys are going on in here. Talk about, like, what happened. Did you surprise the husband, or, or what happened that led to the struggle? I don't know in the house. We know you were there. We are going to put you inside there. The only thing we don't have is your reason for doing it. Or did you go in there to go in and kill a little kid the same age as your sister? He knows who he shot, but it reminds him and amps up that emotional level that this is very, very serious. You did this and a child was killed. You're in somebody else's house when you're not supposed to be in their house. And they are going to either assault you to stop you from doing that, plus they're going to call the cops. <clears throat> Now that's why I think, personally, that's why I think you shot them. It's because you were trying to protect yourself. That's the only reason that I can see. Am I right? I thought so. I thought I was. And that makes me feel better about you. Because I, I just can't see you walking in there and shooting some kid. No, no. It went off accidentally? Yeah. OK. I think it was a pretty important moment. It wasn't the whole truth yet from him, but he's at least admitting that he was in the house and is involved in the shooting. From the time when you went in the ditch, start from the beginning, okay? Well, I went in the ditch, I went up to the house. Okay. Tried the door, it was locked. The vehicle was sitting outside. Right. I opened the feed right in there, and I seen the garage door open. Right. Went in the house, yelled for somebody, and then that's when everything happened up there. And then was your idea maybe to, what? Ask him to come out and help you get out of the ditch? Yeah. Okay. Okay, well, you were where in the house? What part of the house? In the bedroom? No. Okay. And is anybody answering? No. No? Okay. So then what happened? Tell me how this... I said it like five, six times, and I was in the hallway, and that's when he just come right out of the bedroom with the gun. Okay. And it was pointed at you? Yeah, me. Okay. And what did he say? Huh? What did he say? He told me to get out of there and kill him. Right? Then what happened? Huh? Then what happened? Well, I was going to turn it on, and then all of a sudden he pumped the, pumped the gun. He pumped the round into the gun? Right. Jacked the pumper? Yeah. Okay. And then what? That's why. That's when I turned it on and I grabbed it, or grabbed it so that he wouldn't do anything. Okay, then what happened? And then I got it away from him and it went off. And it went off like three times and I we were we there together. So me and him were going at it. Okay, so then it goes off and then how does it hit the wife? When we were struggling. When you're struggling? Yeah. Did, are they saying anything to you? She was just going, oh my God, and then that was it. What happened there? That's when she got shot. She had to go down the stairs and I dropped the gun. Right. And the kid was standing there, too. Talking on the phone? Yep. Okay, so you dropped the gun, and then it went off? Yep. Okay. Did you see it hit the kid? Huh? No. Alex was shot three times. Dropping the gun, it didn't go off three times. And if it did, it would be one time, not three times. It's a pump shotgun. It doesn't work that way. 
I don't believe that there's a struggle. We have three people who've been shot, a couple of them more than one time. So the idea that this was just an unfortunate accident just doesn't fly whatsoever. Both of us felt like we had enough at that point. We placed him under arrest pending criminal charges for murder. I think the jury could see that he was lying and untruthful from the beginning. That was very important to show the jury that he wasn't telling the whole truth, and the evidence supported what actually happened. He was found guilty on two counts of first-degree premeditated murder, which were two consecutive life sentences. He got 216 months for Hillary's attempted murder. But he never showed any remorse for any of this, never indicated he felt bad about what he did or provided a logical explanation or anything for it. And I don't think we'll ever know. Sheriff's Office emergency. It's Emerald Sands. My manager said to call you. I had her desk call me and tell me that they heard multiple gunshots. Coming from a room. Two. So I went down there, and all I did was put the key in the door, open the door, and everything's covered in blood. Billy Boyette and Alicia Greer started dating around Thanksgiving of 2016. Billy Boyette was violent toward Alicia quite often, choked her, kicked her in the face. She just needed a place to get away and hide from him until that could happen. Jacqueline was actively trying to help her hide from Billy Boyette, and that's why she was at the motel that day. She was just in the wrong place at the wrong time, trying to help Alicia in any way that she could. According to Mary Rice's mother, who had the children that belonged to Mary Rice, she had not heard from Mary, which was not normal for her. She was a mother of three. She was doing the best she could as a single mother, worked at a local Dollar General to try to make ends meet. Based upon the statements that were made by the family of Mary Rice, they were concerned about her safety because she would not have abandoned her children. We were alerted about how Billy was known to hang out within Mary Rice's area. And so there is a good possibility that Billy Boyette is involved. We now have a manhunt on for Billy Boyette. Through their investigation and talking to witnesses, we found evidence they did have a relationship. Mary Rice, brother, was incarcerated with Billy Boyette. Witnesses told us that he introduced her to Billy Boyette, and they wrote letters back and forth numerous times. Then Billy got out of prison, and they were kind of known to be together somewhat. We obtained a search warrant and managed to get numerous phone messages between Mary Rice and Billy Boyette on the day those murders occurred. Reading her text and reading his text back and forth, we were able to put two and two together that Mary Rice knew of the problems that he was having with Alicia Greer. Investigators made the determination that she's a willing participant, not a victim. In the early morning hours, we were notified of another homicide in Baldwin County, just across the state line there in Lillian, Alabama. A lady named Peggy Bros was found deceased in her own driveway. 
It appeared that the suspect had shot her in the face in her front yard, then took her keys and her vehicle, which was a white Chrysler Concord. She had been shot with a 38 revolver. The same type of handgun that was used in the homicides of Alicia Greer and Jacqueline Moore. Also, based upon witnesses, the suspect's physical description met that of Billy Boyette. A female by the name of Kayla Crocker was located by her mother, bound in rope. Kayla was shot in the head with a pistol, and there was actually blood splatter and blood spray on the crib from her being shot. Kayla Crocker had been killed and her car taken. They seemed to have no qualms at all about killing somebody and taking their vehicle. Mary Rice had used her ID to check into that hotel. Georgia State Police surrounded the entire motel. Their SWAT team arrived. There was nowhere for them to go. We pretty much figured it was going to be a shootout. They eventually make contact with Mary Rice, telling her that she needs to surrender, come out with her hands up, which she does. Georgia State Police SWAT makes entry. As soon as they make entry, Billy Boyette commits suicide with a gunshot wound to the head. Before we started our interview, Mary Rice was making allegations she was being held against her will by Billy Boyette and that she had been sexually assaulted. Ultimately, that she was, in fact, a victim, not a willing participant. Is he the monster? He's serious about everything he says. He was gonna kill me. If I didn't do what he said, pulling my God's grace and my sitting here today. Take a deep breath, Mary. You're all right now. Just take a deep breath. <laughs> to your knowledge, did the thing at the incident at the Emerald Sands in? Did that happen before he picked you up? Yes. Yes. To my knowledge. All right. Where, where did you go from there? There we were, we were riding, and he made me go into a, a, a Mars. Did he stay out in the car? No. Yeah. He was in. He was in Walmart. Okay. He was watching me, and I know he could see me in the store. What did you get at Walmart? Um, ammunition. She doesn't know. We have the video from Walmart, and we did see that Billy's sitting in the car outside on camera. So we can see he stays there in the vehicle the entire time. And she's in Walmart on camera shopping like there's nothing going on. We tracked her all throughout the store with the interior cameras. She claims that he told her if she made any notifications to anybody, told anybody that he would kill her and kill her children as well. But she's in there by herself. Never did she make any type of notification, ask for help or assistance or anything. She was lying to us. What happens then? I don't know. He comes back with white car. So he goes off with a dark SUV and comes back with a white car? Yes, yes. He has somebody with him. They have a gun on me, they're in the back. I didn't even get a good glimpse of who they were or anything. I had to get in the car and drive. I got to go to my side. I had to follow him to a parking area. When you got into the car to drive, you got a person holding a gun to you, correct? Yes. Where did the, the other, this other guy you're talking oh, no, about, where did he I come never, from? I don't know, and I've never seen him after. I, she has no idea that we have video surveillance of Mary Rice behind the wheel of the vehicle alone in the SUV, following Billy in the white car. We know that she's not telling the truth. OK, that's not true. And I'll tell you we why it's No, we did. Mary, listen to me. Yeah. If I were to tell you that 
numerous people saw you and Billy following the person in the white car to her home, where the white car was taken. You were with Billy because you guys were seen together, okay? There wasn't a third person there. Then. It was just you and Billy, right? Right. Okay. Why did you tell me that? Because I'm this scared. Is, well, I understand I'm you're scared. scared. The truth makes more sense than the story yes, at this point. Does. You know what I that's mean? That's the truth. Okay. Okay. Well, thank and you. That's the only thing that I embellished on. Okay. Well, thank you for being honest. Yeah, I'm scared. I know you are. <laughs> she knew she was caught, had said enough, and then emotions come flooding in. It was a collective agreement between all of us that she was at the point that she was about to shut down. We just chose at that time to abruptly end the interview. I mean, it's cut and dry and clear as it could be. We had enough that we had a signed arrest warrant by a judge to charge her with murder. Thank you for your cooperation. <laughs> Mary Rice is as guilty as Billy Boyette. She had a choice, and she chose to follow Billy Boyette. And she is paying the price for her actions. We will never understand why things happen the way they did. The thing we have to understand is there's evil in this world. 